and just life after that, like, although that deportation was close to over 10 years ago, um, to this day, like, that moment is still causing a lot of pain and a lot of trauma in our family. Um, Thank you so much for coming on board, Sergio, with La Cima Memorias. Yeah, so uh, my name is Sergio Barrera. Uh, I live in Everett and I work for the Everett YMCA where I am the teen director. So I'm in charge of the teen center and a couple of youth programs based out of the Everett School District. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your story, who you are? Yes, so I have lived in Everett. I just found out it was actually 22 years now. I got here in 98, not 2000. So I had my story completely completely wrong um but i got to everett in 1998 um lived here ever since uh we came up here to reunite with my dad um we were actually coming on vacation and uh our tourist visas expired so like to this day i still say i'm like on a 22 year vacation um but yeah uh i'm a undocumented uh went through the educational system here in the US and technically consider this home now. Um, as much as like I pride myself in like being Mexican, like I, I understand that this is home. I'm coming to terms with that. So like I said, I got here on a tourist visa in 1998. Um, life was pretty good. Uh, dad had a stable job, uh, jobs more like. Um, going to school. When I got here, like I was probably, I had only gone through two years of kindergarten in Mexico. So I knew what it was to speak like kindergarten level Spanish. I didn't know how to read or write Spanish. Um, and I didn't know how to read, write or speak English. So I had to go through school, um, really not understanding what the teacher was saying. Um, I remember telling my dad like, hey, like I need you to come to class with me because I don't feel comfortable. Like, um, so my dad would, my dad or mom would come to class. They'd sit there with me throughout part of the school day. Um, but it wasn't until a few years ago that I realized that they also didn't speak English. So they had no idea what was being said, but they were there to comfort me and like provide that support. I think the moment that definitely the moment that changed like the course of history for my family here in the U S was when I was in third grade. Um, it was around like five in the morning. Uh, I heard a pounding at the door and I was sleeping on the couch at that time because um, my uncle was here from Mexico. And I was sleeping on the couch, uh, five in the morning, I just start hearing pounding and I'm confused. Uh, my little sister is the first one that got up um, and I just start hearing FBI open up, open up. Um, so I like look over the couch and my little sister is opening the door and uh, she gets knocked to the ground, uh, guns pointed at her and then people just swarm our house. Um, they were looking for my dad. Um, he was uh, being accused of uh, drug related charges. Um, I'm still not clear on what those charges were, um, but they ended up uh, detaining him there. Um, they like, our house was literally like flipped, like, like it, there was an earthquake and like, I just relate my house that day to like pictures of like devastating earthquakes. That's what it felt my house turned into. Piles of clothing on the, on the floor, on the beds, paperwork all over the place. Um, my uncle was there visiting. Uh, he ended up getting detained and deported as well. Um, he was here on a tourist visa, uh, but they ended up deporting him even though they weren't there for him specifically. Um, I remember I had this red, uh, red bed like this, uh, at that time it was the, the Corvette. So the Corvettes were in style and like, it was a red Corvette bed. And, uh, I always wanted one and I finally had gotten one. Um, but with my dad being detained, like that was the main source of income. So we had to move out, sell all our belongings, uh, TV couches. Um, that bed actually went to one of my, uh, one of my friends at that time. So for me, like, I had to step into his house because we were good friends and like just see that bed there, like, 
as a kid, like I didn't understand like why my bed got moved like from house to house and like why it wasn't mine anymore. Um, I just knew that we went from living into apartment to staying in one room with my mom and uh, three sisters. Um, my dad uh, was found innocent uh, a year later um, of all charges. Uh, but the prosecuting officer didn't take that too lightly and the judge ordered him to be released uh, the following day at 12. Um, but I got to I got to him before they were able to release him at the jail. So he ended up being deported. Um, and just life after that, like, although that deportation was close to over 10 years ago, um, to this day, like, that moment is still causing a lot of pain and a lot of trauma in our family. Um, and it's all going untalked about. So there's definitely a lot of healing that we have to go and do um in terms of that that was kind of like the turning point of my family here in the u.s um in terms of being undocumented and going to school i had no idea what that meant uh, until like i said i shared my story at la cima um i came back and started asking questions and it was my um counselor Leilene ortiz who um told me that I, I was misinformed so i was told that being undocumented like i wouldn't be able to go to school here in the u.s or get a job um, and that came because I wanted to get a job so I could pay for select soccer. And that's when I was told that like, you can't even work, you can't go to school. So I didn't try like at school until about late junior year, senior year, um, when I was told that like my grades are bad, but that doesn't mean you can't make something happen. So that's when I kind of started picking up the pace and uh, applying for scholarships, exploring the idea of college because I didn't explore that idea. Um, I just wanted to play soccer. Um, But that's when I found out that being undocumented and exploring those opportunities was like, it was not the, tradi the traditional pathway of most students. The school didn't know how to serve me. Um, they were going to grade me on not turning in FAFSA when I wasn't even eligible. Um, there were certain resources that weren't available either. Scholarships were hard. And this was all prior to uh, the, real, the Real Hope Act here in Washington. Um, and prior to DACA. So DACA got approved when I was about to graduate, give or take. Um, so once all that started happening, things started changing. And uh, yeah, definitely the experience of being undocumented in high school um, through the educational system is, it was tough. It was tough in that era, um, especially not knowing like what that meant overall. And once you did figure out what it meant, like, there was a sense of hopelessness, for sure. And just life after that, like, although that deportation was close to over 10 years ago, um, to this day, like, that moment is still causing a lot of pain and a lot of trauma in our family. That, that uh, had to come back because we got in a huge car accident. Uh, so we were about to, like, start heading, making our way back to Mexico. Um, but we got in a huge car accident on New Year's Day with uh, my mom was in the hospital for it felt like months, um, but I'm pretty sure it was only like two, three weeks. Um, but as a kid at that time, like not having anybody else here, uh, we had to stay at a friend's house, me and my sisters. Um, dad ended up making it back a month or so later. Families here, uh, I think the things that are holding us together, the people are definitely the little ones, the first generation of US citizens in our family. Uh, Baby Tatum and Agustin and now Valentina. If they were on this call, could tell them something, what would you say? I'll go one by one. I think for my dad, I would start off by telling him that I don't want to ask questions about what happened that one morning and if it was true or not. Um, I'd rather just give him the benefit of the doubt and uh, help him heal because I know that being in the prison system and then getting deported after like knowing that you're innocent, like it must, it must be tough to you this day. Um, so I would say like, I give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, I don't hold anything against him. Um, my mom, I would just, 
I don't know anybody who would have been able to do what she did at that time. Um, and yeah, I just, that I love her and like, again, like I don't hold anything against her and I don't know another human being that would have been able to get us through what she got us through at that time. And my sisters, uh, I'll just tell them that I know I don't show up enough for them, um, but I do what I do with keeping our childhood experiences in mind and not wanting other youth to go through what we went through. Um, but I keep them in mind every single day and I love them even though I, like I publicly acknowledge that I don't show up enough for them. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, bridge those, bridge those disconnections in your families if you have them and if you're able to. Uh, before it gets to a level of like you legit not knowing what it's going to take to to figure out how you can reconnect as a family. Can you tell me what La Cima means to you? La Cima provides a space for youth to not have to grow through the cracks. Um, a lot of times we put a lot of emphasis on the youth that um, are able to grow and prosper and bloom through through the cracks um, and more power to them. But I would just ask like, I would just say La Cima is a space where we remove that concrete and let students grow on soil. And we, we plant the seed, we help water the seed um, and we give every student the opportunity to grow um, as they need to. And if they express that we're not providing the resources that they need, um, we're always very mindful and come back and figure out how to provide what they need in the time that they need it. Um, so yeah, I, I, La Cima means to me basically that, that we're, we're able to remove barriers uh, for students um, to be able to express who they are uh, and how they want to express themselves, more importantly. What do you take away from La Cima that you use in your life right now? Every time I go, it um, on the more selfish end, I use it to ground myself and re-motivate, re-energize, and just remind myself of why it is that I do what I do. Um, so I use La Cima's energy, the energy from the students, the energy from the staff, um, to refuel myself and go back and be able to serve the students in the capacity that they need to be served, and overall the community. Um, what would you say is your favorite memory from La Cima? Second year JC, uh, uh, Dogwood one, uh, dorm D one, uh, quick, quick shout out to dorm D one that year. Um, I think that year was the first space I've ever been in a space where we had around 15 to 20 young men all crying in the same space. And it all came because of one student whose name was Alejandro, who was having a rough time the first two days. And once he opened up to all of us, we all, we would embrace him and most importantly each other. And we were able to like for a moment break through those emotions that men have been told that we couldn't show. And we were able to do it with other men within the same space. So I, that, that was definitely my, uh, my favorite La Cima memory. And I definitely still remember a lot of those guys and try to connect with them because that was a really powerful experience. What keeps you going in this moment? I think just acknowledging like the privilege that I have to be able to put myself in spaces and also like step out of spaces. I think for me, I'm analyzing like the pain that that causes communities and the damage that it could cause. So for me, um, like checking myself on what, why it is that I do what I do and like making sure that it is community based and not centered around myself. Um, so I'm, I'm keeping more in tune with what the community is saying, what it needs, um, and just actually like sitting there and listening to the needs of the students, to the needs of parents of students. Just recently you ran like 14 miles for a fundraiser. So do you want to tell yeah. us a little bit about, about that? Yeah. So, um, Al Sharpton announced the March on Washington. Uh, he wanted to make a, he wants to start the March on Washington and after I think 58 years uh, the, on the 58 year anniversary. So um, 
in my position right now, I currently serve more black youth than Latino youth. Um, I don't exactly know what that is. I'm still trying to analyze why and how I was able to gain the trust of black youth um, to the degree that I have. Um, but a friend of mine, Ashley Smith, quick shout out to Ashley. She reached out, she wanted us to like coordinate a trip so we can take youth from Snohomish County down to Washington, DC. Um, so it was overnight, we set up the fundraiser. Uh, we wanted to have the $14,000 rates by the time that, um, by the time that we had the parent info session so we could like be able to tell parents like, hey, if you're used to submit an application, like you don't have to worry about um, anything any of the money and that's because like i like i want to make sure that opportunities are accessible to youth and money isn't the first thing that comes to mind when um they see opportunity um so i offered to run 14 miles if we were able to raise uh it was three thousand at that point in the next like five hours and we did so now 12 youth and uh three chaperones from some home black youth and 12 and three chaperones are going to go to DC in August and visit two HBCUs, Howard and Bowie, uh, go to the Smithsonian's, go to certain hotels, and most importantly, like attend the March on Washington, which is why we're there. That, that was my first time uh, running that long of a distance in one, in one go. Previously to that was 10 miles, but uh, that was a very like grounding experience. Um, I just took it upon myself to like, for the first time, use words of affirmation while I was running um, and just reminding myself like when my body was in pain, like why I was running and the commitment I made to the community. Um, so I just gained energy through that. Uh, there was times where I was like cramping up and like I was just, I, I was wanting to stop, but I just, like I said, reminding myself like the commitment I made to the community um, is more powerful than like, I guess I gained power through that to continue running and uh, finish off the 14 miles. Uh, I couldn't walk for like two or three days. It was, it was, I couldn't walk. Um, but like I said, um, just a reminder of like why I did it. Like that for me, it was like that beats out all the pain that uh, I was feeling. So I started, uh, I've been working with youth since I want to say senior years when I started like doing like mentoring projects and not necessarily mentoring, but more like tutoring. So I was tutoring uh, elementary schoolers. And then uh, I kind of gained that spark through uh, a few staff members at La Cima that were in a club called Mecha, organization called Mecha at Everett Community College, who took their time to come back and mentor the youth that uh, they saw themselves as at the high schools that they went to. Um, so I always like, I always held that to my heart deeply and uh, just wanted to do the same thing once I got to college. So I got hired at the Y five years ago and I was just working at a teen center. Um, and I guess to wrap it all up, like I literally owe where the position I am today, like whether that's like financially, uh, job wise professional career i really owe that to the youth that i serve through the ymca um because they literally like organized and rallied to to get me in the position that i am uh and i just approach youth development as like um as a space where i can give youth uh experiences that i didn't have um I guess I could tie a story to that. So uh, we went, we got to go to a snowboarding trip and uh, it was the first time these five youth were snowboarding and they were having a, a hard time strapping themselves onto the snowboards. They would try to stand up, fall right away, but they were laughing through every single moment of it. And I was, I was watching them. Like I just realized that I do what I do because I want these students when they grow up and fill my shoes, fill our, our roles that they provide experiences to other youth because they got to experience it and not because they wish they got to experience it because it was then when I realized like, dang, like I would have loved to experience that with all my friends from high school at that time. But like 
coming to terms with like that might not get to happen ever. So I, I, I love to provide those experiences so they don't have to sit there like wondering what it would have been like. They're providing, they're gonna provide experiences to youth because they know what it was like. What impact has La Cima made in your life? It's, it's hard because every La Cima, like yes, it's called La Cima, but every La Cima is different. There's no La Cima that's ever the same. So there's, I think I can take bits and pieces out of every La Cima, but I'll, I'll go with the one when I was a delegate. So 2011, that was the first time that I opened up about um, being undocumented, but yeah, I guess at that time, the word undocumented didn't exist yet. So I think I still referred to myself as illegal. Um, it was the first time I got to share that story um, and just talk about like what it was like when our home was being raided and uh, like the traumas that that caused. Um, but also I didn't have a full grasp and understanding of what that meant overall like I just kind of shared and like I didn't know that that was gonna limit me access to many things um so it provided me that platform to finally like share those feelings that I had been like holding on to and never discussed um out of fear right like our, my mom always told us like not to share that stuff because like you never know who it could who it could get to and that could provide more repercussions for us um, but then that was also the first time that we sat at a campfire with, with all the guys in the camp and I got to hear Joe, Vince, and Luis talk about what manhood is and just have a discussion on manhood. And that brought a lot of insight because it was the first time I was getting to hear from men of color what it was to be a man and more particularly like a straight male um, in a Latino household and how we can go about serving those roles in a better way than what we've typically been used to. It provided a spark to continue exploring what that meant. Um, overall, I think it's, it's gonna be an ever learning process. Um, I don't feel comfortable saying that I'm the perfect male role model um, because I know it's gonna take a lifelong of like learning and uh, really until we fully dismantle what patriarchy is, like I don't, I don't think I can consider myself the perfect male role model. What is a book or a podcast you recommend to everyone? The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Um, and that was when I read, got through that book, it was, it provided a lot of insight on just the, the everyday struggle and especially how like systems have been like transformed and we really haven't advanced much as a society. What is a piece of advice you would say to your younger self or wish you would have heard when you were younger? Don't be afraid to question everything. Uh, I think through high school, like we, we let microaggression slip. We let instances of racism from teachers and staff and administration slip and didn't actually realize how much trauma that caused until I'm seeing it now through my youth and what they're experiencing currently through their journey in high school. What is a call to action that you have for our listeners? Just going back to this whole, like the COVID and the pandemic and everything. Um, for some folks returning back to normal, for particularly white folks returning back to normal was getting haircuts, going to salons, and doing uh, all these other things. But if we keep in mind the black community, returning back to normal for them meant losing Ahmed, Brianna, George Floyd, amongst other people. Um, so my call to action would be like, let's not return back to normal. Um, let's redefine what normal is so it benefits, most importantly, the black community. Um, because like, all lives matter can't really matter until Black Lives Matter. Who are you most grateful for in this current moment? I can't, I can't bring that down to one person. I, I would say that uh, definitely my, my network of people um, that keep me grounded and keep me focused and uh, just keep me going in all reality. Um, if I can name a few folks, it definitely be my family, uh, my sister, Laura, Maria, their, their babies, Tatum, Agustin, and Valentina, and my mom and dad. Um, 
Roberto, Ricardo, uh, you, I had to give you a shout out too. Um, and then uh, definitely the, the, the youth that I get to work with, um, they've, they're powerful and I get to learn from them every single day. I just want to acknowledge you. Um, I've seen you in La Cima. I've seen you in spaces where you're with youth and how they look up to you and like you're just a mentor to them. You should be really proud of where you are right now and I would just say that it it's hurtful to say that next week we'll have been at La Cima um, but we're trying to figure out how to better provide and hopefully we take this year to make La Cima 10 times better of what it normally is. So I, I don't really request like time off of work um, or anything like that. But if like I ever get like new supervisors, new new jobs or anything like that, um, like I make sure to tell them like, hey, last week of June is taken already. So um, just keep that in mind. If you want to hire me, like last week of June is taken. Like it's probably marked off in my calendar for the next couple of years. So. Well, thank you so much.